Well, I'm going to devote today's podcast to Bitcoin. I mean, I might as well just talk about Bitcoin because that's all anybody else is talking about. In fact, on CNBC, that's pretty much all they talked about today. Although they said it was Bitcoin week at CNBC, and it sure sounds like, in fact, I think they should rename the network, right? It's the CNBC, the Crypto News Bitcoin Network is what CNBC should call itself. You know, I haven't been on CNBC in a long, long time. And it's no secret, you know, that I've got a lot of uh, problems with Bitcoin. You'd think they would call me. They have so many debates going on back and forth all day long, bull bear debates on Bitcoin. They don't want to bring me on. I mean, either pro or con, right? I mean, I guess I could take either, either stance because I think I know the argument of both sides pretty much better than anybody. Uh, but nope, you know, because I remember one time somebody had accused me of being some kind of shill that, you know, CNBC would bring out to trash Bitcoin. If they wanted to trash Bitcoin, they would bring me out. They don't want to. In fact, maybe they're getting a lot of viewers now uh, because they spend their whole day talking about Bitcoin. So uh, that's generally what they did, you know, back in the dot com mania. These guys like to pretend you know, that they knew it was a bubble. They they knew nothing. They they they, they uh, swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. They drunk all the Kool-Aid that was being served in the 1990s. Nobody was bearish. They were completely, uh, you know, immense in, 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 in the mania. And yeah, when they look back at it, they like to laugh. But they didn't laugh back then. Not at all. I mean, they, the only people they laughed at were the people who came on, like David Tice, who would occasionally come on and talk about the mania, and they would laugh at him, you know, just like they laughed at me when I was talking about, uh, you know, the bubble leading up to the financial crisis. So nobody at CNBC had any idea uh, that there was a dot-com bubble. Uh, all they did was, uh, you know, laugh at people who, who pointed it out. Same thing is kind of going on, although they talk about the Bitcoin bubble. But, you know, I, I listen to a lot of uh, these interviews, and to me... This bubble is the most irrational of any of the bubbles I've seen. I think I, I think there is less of a legitimate case uh, for for Bitcoin than there was for the any of the dot com stocks that went to zero, right? Or you know buying subprime mortgages. But let me talk a little bit about the whole origin of this thing. Uh, so, in, in case you don't know, because when Bitcoin first came about, right? And it was the only cryptocurrency out there because now there's over 1,300 of them. The market cap is over 450 billion. 450 billion. Uh, Bitcoin is trading today over 17,000. Uh, that's a new record high on Bitstamp, which is the the, the website I'm looking at. Uh, it, it, I guess it didn't take out the 19,000 and change record that was set at Coinbase. Uh, last week, but it's you know it's a new high for this particular exchange. We're up about I don't know 15, 20 percent today. We debuted on futures trading. Futures started trading Sunday night. Saturday, in advance of that, we had a pretty decent sell off. Uh, Bitcoin sold off uh, below thirteen thousand. I think twelve thousand seven hundred was the low I saw, and then it skyrocketed. It turned around on Sunday and then continued up on uh, on Monday. But back in the beginning, there was just one currency. And it was Bitcoin. And the whole idea behind Bitcoin was that it was going to be money. Right? It was going to be an alternative. It was, a, it was a digital currency. And it was supposedly, hey, I can send this currency to anyone anywhere in the world anonymously, but also inexpensively and very quickly. Because it's hard to send dollars. If I want to send dollars, I have to go to a bank. They do a wire. They charge me 10, 20 bucks to do the wire. And so it's expensive and I got to involve the banking system. And Bitcoin was a cheaper way uh, to send money than the bank or than Western Union. And, and my initial problem with Bitcoin had nothing to do with that. I love that aspect of it. I thought that was great that... You know, you could you can send it so easily, uh, and and that part of it I liked. What I didn't like was that it had no backing, that it had no real value. So I knew it could never actually be money, because there is no history of money not first being a commodity. Money was always a commodity first. It was money second. It was the commodity that was most easily accepted in trade for other commodities that became money. But it was always a commodity first. And money second. Now, of course, when government took over and got involved 
and they started to come out with with paper money, fiat money. I mean, first the first paper currency was backed by real money. That's what gave it value. It was paper currency backed by real money, and it was more convenient to use. That was the whole idea. Hey, I have a hundred dollar bill, or you know, that's more convenient to use than the equivalent amount of silver or gold. Right? I'm just going to hold this piece of paper. I can stuff it in my wallet. And it was more convenient than actual money, but it was the actual money that gave the piece of paper value because all by itself, the paper was worthless, right? It was the gold backing it up that made it have value. And when the government, like in the United States, eventually went off the gold standard, it did this in a slow process, but the people were used to using dollars. See, when people were transacting in dollars in 1880, 1890, 1900, right? They were transacting in gold, but nothing was priced in gold. If something was $20, the price wasn't an ounce of gold. The price was $20. Now, $20 was an ounce of gold, but the public got used to thinking of things in terms of dollars. Prices were in dollars, even though the dollar itself was a unit of weight of gold. It was a measurement of how much gold was there. But over time, when the government gradually took us off the gold standard, people continued to use dollars even though they were no longer backed by gold. But it was the fact that they were originally backed by gold that enabled them to be accepted. But Bitcoin was introduced on the scene having never had any value whatsoever. There was never anything backing up Bitcoin from day one. And so that's why I didn't think that it was going to work because I said, look, you know, it's it's just a digital nothing. I said at the beginning, what's to stop other cryptocurrencies from being created that do the exact same thing as Bitcoin? And that's exactly what's happened. I mean, there's over a thousand other cryptocurrencies. In fact, most of those thousand are better than Bitcoin at, at doing what Bitcoin originally promised that it could do, but which it can't do at all right now. Because right now, it is very expensive. I'm you know, listening to people talk about, about Bitcoin, but apparently... If you want to do a transaction, if I wanted to send somebody Bitcoin, it could take several hours to more than a day for my Bitcoin to transfer. And it could cost 50 to to $100 to make the transfer. I mean, so obviously I can't send somebody $10 worth of Bitcoin if it's going to cost me $50 to send it. I'm minus 40. I might as well. I mean, Western Union is cheaper than Bitcoin and Western Union is expensive. So Bitcoin is actually a very inexp- a very inefficient way to pay for something. Now, I guess if you want to buy something very expensive, like a car, a $50,000 car, oh, if it costs 50 or 100 bucks to send the money, all right, I guess if somebody wants to sell a car for Bitcoin, but that wasn't the, the use case. It was going to enable poor people all around the world that have lousy currencies uh, to be able to live their lives in Bitcoin, buy their groceries with Bitcoin. Well, it's impossible. It costs more to spend your Bitcoin than a lot of people make in a day in these poorer countries. They can't, they can't to just buy one thing, one loaf of bread. It would cost more than a month's income to just buy the loaf of bread if you're going to pay for the loaf of bread uh, with Bitcoin or however long, weeks income. I'm not sure what the, uh, you know, which country. But the point is, it cannot do what it, it originally promised to do, which is serve as a, a medium of exchange. And the thing that's so crazy about it, when you listen to all these people talk about Bitcoin on, on CNBC, and they acknowledge that, they know that, they say that doesn't matter because now it's digital gold. Wait a minute. So the whole reason that the original people who liked Bitcoin liked it better than gold was, well, you can't use your gold to buy a cup of coffee. That's what everybody said. You can't use your gold to buy a cup of coffee, but I can buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin. Well, now when they acknowledge, nope, you can't buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin either. So it's just like gold. So, but it's better than gold. Why? If you can't buy a cup of coffee with it, why is it better than gold? It's not. It's it's nothing. It's It's not even better than all the other cryptocurrencies that are out there. The other thing that's so crazy about the people who are now, you know, touting Bitcoin is the original people that got on board, right? They, they didn't trust the Federal Reserve. They didn't trust paper money, right? They didn't trust the governments. They didn't like all the quantitative easing. These were a lot of people who might have otherwise bought gold, 
but they actually like Bitcoin. They thought, hey, this is better, right? This is better than gold. I can use it. And they, they, they got very excited about it. But the people who are promoting it today, they, they don't distrust the government. They, they, they love the Federal Reserve. They think they're great. They, they don't think there's anything wrong with the dollar or the euro or the yen, right? They like these currencies. They like banks. So what is the purpose of Bitcoin then? You know, if you don't have any problem with any of these other fiat currencies, then why do you need Bitcoin? And, you know, the people who are talking about how it's digital gold, they never bought any actual gold. They, ha- they never had any interest in real gold. So why are they interested in this? Because they think that people who want real gold are going to buy Bitcoin instead. They're not. The people that want to store value. When I hear these guys like Brian Kelly on CNBC saying Bitcoin is a store of value. What value are you storing? There is nothing to store. I mean, once you say that you're not going to be able to use it as as currency, once you've said, look, it's too slow, it's too expensive, it can't actually be used as a digital currency, but we're just going to use it as a store of value, what is its value? What is its function? What can it do? Absolutely nothing. This is the problem. Yet nobody wants to acknowledge that fact because they're, they're too caught up in the mania. They can't see the forest for the trees because they're so deep in it. Now, does the fact that the price keeps going up, does that change anything? No. I mean, yes, it suckers more people in and people believe that the higher price is validating the fact that they're right. And people like me go, I must be wrong because I say Bitcoin's not going to work, yet the price keeps going up. The price going up and Bitcoin working have nothing to do with one another. As long as people think that it's going to work, then they'll keep on buying it. And as long as the people who own it don't sell, and then there's not a lot of supply for the new people who want to buy, the market could keep going up. And that's what's going on. But it's not going to go on forever. You know, there's an old saying on uh, Wall Street, bulls make money, bears make money, and pigs get slaughtered, right? And there's a lot of pigs uh, who are going to get slaughtered when it comes to Bitcoin because they're not selling. Because everybody regrets. Anybody who's ever sold Bitcoin regrets having sold it because it's higher now, right? Anything you sold, oh my God, if I only didn't sell it, look how much more money I would have. And people have now been conditioned not to sell. And, you know, it's not wrong selling. Look, if Bitcoin, let's say Bitcoin goes to 30,000, right? Forget, let's, let's say it goes to 30,000 and then it collapses down to 1,000. And ultimately, I think it's going a lot lower than 1,000. I think it's eventually going to zero. I don't think it's going to be worth anything. I don't even think it's going to be a collector's item. But I don't know how long it's going to take to get there. But let's say it goes from 30,000 to 1,000. If somebody sold at 16,000, were they wrong? Even though it went up to 30,000, well, they weren't wrong. If it goes down to 1,000, now, could they have timed it better? Well, yeah, they could have timed it perfectly. But let's say somebody takes it all the way up to 30,000 and never sell any. Oh, yeah, they laugh at the guy who sold at 16,000. Hey, look, you idiot, look, it's at 30,000. Well, if you're still holding your Bitcoin at 1,000 or lower, then who was the fool, right? Now, I know, Peter, hey, but somebody somebody could have bought it at 20 bucks. And so they're still ahead of 1,000. Yeah, I mean, there are some people that got in really, really early. Now, just because you're playing with the house's money, does that mean you have to give the house back all that money? No, take some of it off the table. Sell into it. You know, Put some of your, of your winnings uh, into, into something real, like gold, like silver, like, like stocks, or spend it. Go buy yourself something. Buy a house, buy a car, buy some clothes. Get something real. Because when you have Bitcoin, you have nothing real, right? You have digital nothing. You have a digital currency backed by nothing, right? How is that any different than a paper currency backed by nothing? Yes, they can theoretically limit the supply of Bitcoins, but there's Bitcoin Cash, which by the way is, you know, Bitcoin Cash can actually do for now what Bitcoin promised to do, but can no longer do. So if you're going to be in Bitcoin at all, be in Bitcoin Cash. Forget about Bitcoin. Bitcoin Cash is probably going to be Bitcoin until somebody else out Bitcoins them, right? I mean, what about EOS that's supposed to be much, much faster Uh, than that one, and then what's going to be faster than EOS, right? Somebody can always come up with a better cryptocurrency until one day someone figures out how to crack the code of all the cryptocurrencies, and then then what are they worth? But the other thing that is interesting, if you really buy into this idea, right, that 
The blockchain is going to revolutionize everything and everything is going to be on the blockchain. The, the blockchain itself is what is Bitcoin's biggest competitor, right? You don't have to worry about gold because once everything is on the blockchain, right? The dollar can be on the blockchain. The euro can be on the blockchain. The yen, the U.S. treasuries can be on the blockchain. Uh, corporations can issue stock certificates through the blockchain, right? So if you want to buy shares of IBM, IBM could trade on the New York Stock Exchange, but there can also be IBM shares that are uh, registered through a blockchain. And therefore, people can go and buy stock in IBM or every single stock in the S&P 500. I don't need a stockbroker. I can just buy using the blockchain technology. I can buy a share of IBM and I can keep it in my digital wallet right next to my Bitcoin right, or my Litecoin. I can have my digital IBM share. We can have the exact same rights as an actual share of IBM. And when it comes to dividend, I guess I can get a dividend. They can send me cash. IBM can pay uh, the dividends uh, in uh, maybe extra shares, or maybe you can pick any of the different cryptocurrencies to get your dividend or crypto dollars or whatever they have at the time. But once you can have all these assets that are trading peer to peer, you know, through, um, you know, the internet, I mean, they can have uh, bearer bonds, you know, like treasury bonds or JGBs or, uh, you know, gilts. They can all they can all be issued. Governments can just do uh, direct issues and they can sell bonds using the blockchain. So now, you know, if somebody is, you know, living in some poor country and they don't like the local currency and they want to go online and buy some crypto asset, right? Because that's how they're positioning Bitcoin. It's a crypto asset. Well, what if I can buy treasuries? crypto? What if I can buy uh, IBM crypto or Apple? Pick your stock. Buy whatever stock you want. Or maybe they could have an S&P 500 index crypto coin. I mean, everything could be out there on the blockchain. So if you could choose from all sorts of other assets and you can choose from other cryptocurrencies that are much better to use than, than Bitcoin. But if you have the choice between a digital currency backed by nothing and a digital currency backed by something, wouldn't you want the one that was backed by something? I mean, initially, they're not backed by anything, so nobody really had the choice. But if this technology becomes widely adopted, and assuming the governments you know, don't crack down on it, well, then the good money will chase out bad money. Cryptocurrencies backed by something will be preferred to cryptocurrencies backed by nothing. And of course, you know, if you bought a share, let's say you bought some crypto IBM, at least you would know what to pay for it because you would know what the actual value of IBM stock is because you can see where it's trading in New York. And so the price of a crypto share of IBM would have to be pretty close to the share price on the New York Stock Exchange. If not, there would be an arbitrage opportunity and traders would come in and buy one and sell the other until the, the prices were back in line. But you don't have that with Bitcoin because there is no actual Bitcoin. Right? Bitcoin itself doesn't exist. It's just numbers. It's just a mathematical equation. You can't hold it in your hand. They when they when they try to show a Bitcoin, they always they make a coin that looks like gold. They put the big B on it. They shouldn't put a gold coin on there. They should just put a bunch of numbers. Right? It's trying to make it look like it's something that it's not. You know, I got a phone call today. Very very funny phone call. I'm not making this up. First time this happened. Guy calls my office. Got through to me. I picked up the phone. And the guy's speaking in an accent, right? Turns out he's originally from Jamaica, uh, but he lives in Connecticut now. And, and I know this because I started asking him questions, but he, he calls me and he sounds kind of weird. And, I, and I'm like, well, what can I help you? Can I help you? What, you know, what can I do for you? And he says, I'd like to buy some Bitcoin. Can, I, you know, can you sell me some Bitcoin? I'm not making this up. And I asked the guy, well, where'd you get my name? He says, well, a friend of mine. You know, or gave me this phone number. I said, "Well, you know, I don't, I don't sell Bitcoin. I mean, we're stockbrokers, we're asset management company. I mean, that, you know, we don't, you, you, I can't sell you some Bitcoin." But I started asking him, you know, like what he does for a living. He's a delivery. He drives a delivery truck, and he has a very thick Jamaican accent. Uh, he lives in Connecticut now, and I asked him, you know, do you even know what Bitcoin is? And he said, "Yeah, it's a coin." He said, "It's a, it's a digital coin," and I, you know, I, I, I said, "Well, how do you know about it?" I go from the internet. So he doesn't really know much about it, but he wants to buy it. And he's calling me up to buy, like I can sell it to him. Um, but, you know, 
this is what is going on in a mania. Now, is this indication that this mania still has a long way to go? You know, a lot of people are afraid to short this thing. You know, a lot of the uh, brokers, Interactive Brokers is one of the brokers that is allowing Bitcoin futures. And um, they won't allow their, their clients to short. They're afraid to let people go short. They can only go long. It's a one-way bet. Now, obviously, somebody's got to be allowed to go short because if you can't go long unless you've got somebody going short on the other side. Uh, so somebody is shorting, but people are nervous. And one of the reasons they're nervous is because no one knows how high it can go because it has no value, right? If Bitcoin can go to 17000 why can't it go to 100000 I mean, that's what people are saying because the 100000 number is just as crazy as the seventeen, because none of them make any sense because there's nothing actual there that you can value. And when people, you know, are trying to say, well, you know, it's valuable because I can give it to somebody, that doesn't make it valuable just because somebody wants it because they may not want it in the future. The original use case was that it was valuable because it was going to be the money of the future, right? People were going to ultimately use it. Yes, they were going to hoard it for a while until it ultimately reached a plateau, but then everybody was going to use it for money. But now that we all know no one's going to use it for money because it's too expensive and too slow and there are better cryptocurrencies out there, Yet everybody is still holding on to Bitcoin because now, well, now it's, well, it's just digital gold. It's a digital asset. It's a store of value. What value are we storing if it's not going to be used as money? And to say, well, it's just going to be used because people are buying it now. Yeah, they're buying it now because it's going up. That is what it's used for. That is the value of Bitcoin. It is a speculative asset that you can buy that will go up right after you buy it. And that's why people want it because they think it will make them rich, right? So it's a ticket to wealth. It's a ticket to riches, right? That's what people want, right? They want something big and it, it's a lottery ticket that can't lose as far as everybody's concerned. So that is its value. But what happens when it starts to lose? What happens when it drops 50, 60, 70, 80, 90%? Then what? Now all of a sudden people don't look at it as a freebie. All of a sudden, hey, now, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, Bitcoin has dropped 80, 90 percent a few times before and it's been no big deal. Yeah, it was no big deal when not that many people owned it. That's when you had a lot more diehard true believers that, you know, really were in this thing forever. But the people who are buying now, the people who have been buying the last year, these are not the true believers. These are not the libertarians. These are not the anarcho-capitalists. These are just people who want to make money and want to get rich and are jumping on a bandwagon, right? And believe me, when this thing runs off the tracks, when this thing goes down 90%, they're not going to say, oh, no big deal. I'm just going to hold on. I mean, maybe for a little while, but then a lot of people aren't going to want to buy, you know, and then you're going to have people who are finally going to want to sell. You're going to have the, you know, the people who have been holding on. All right, well, then they want to get, they want to get out. Well, Who's going to take the other side of the trade? I mean, for all the value, there is not a lot of volume going on. The The number of futures contracts that actually traded, it was very, very small total volume in contracts. So even though it's getting all this publicity, all this press, and yes, it's getting there's buyers out there, in the scheme of things, there's not that much liquidity if some of the bigger players really want to start to get out. Or if a lot of the smaller players decide that they want out at the same time. And of course, if a lot of people want out, somebody has to want in. And if other people don't want in, then even a small number of people trying to get out can implode the market. You've got to have these new buyers coming in uh, to buy. But the, the, the crazy thing is to watch all of the coverage on television and all the people who had no understanding of Bitcoin five, six, seven years ago, right? When it first started, have no degree of skepticism whatsoever about central banks, have no idea about the history of money. All of a sudden they think there's this new asset class, uh, Bitcoin, that is going to have all this value, yet they don't question the value of treasury bonds, of US dollars. Because if you really believe that Bitcoin is going to go up another tenfold or a hundredfold, then you have to believe, as I said in my last podcast, that there's massive inflation coming, that the value of bonds is going to implode, that commodity prices are going to take off because you can't create 
trillions and trillions of dollars of purchasing power out of thin air without creating trillions of dollars of products to purchase. You can't create all this wealth and do it in a vacuum. If the people who own Bitcoin are really going to be this rich, then it has to be at the expense of everybody else because they are not creating anything. So this would be a giant transfer of wealth, yet the people who are out there on CNBC talking about how high it's going to be, they're not telling people you better get rid of your dollars, you get a bit better get rid of your treasuries, you're going to get wiped out. They somehow think that Bitcoin can go way up and none of this other stuff can go way down. That's another inconsistency in the argument. But of course, there is no real valid argument to support this. This is just pure hype. This is just pure mania. It's going up because it's going up. And I, you know, once in a while, you know, I, I listen to some people ask questions about the people, you know, why is Bitcoin going up? What is it? Well, because there's only 21 million of them, right? And because everybody wants it and because it's the first mover and it's got all this infrastructure. None of that matters. That's part of the story. That's part of the hype, right? That, that That's what people are saying to justify their irrational behavior. But when you ask them, what is the value in, inherent in Bitcoin? What can you do with it? Absolutely nothing. Yes, I can transfer it to somebody else and there can be a record of who owned it, but you're transferring nothing and you have a record of who owns nothing. What difference does it make if you own nothing, the fact that you can have a record of the people who owned the nothing before you do? If it's gonna work, as I said, if Blockchain itself is going to be as big a revolution as the people who are buying Bitcoin claim than if blockchain itself is something that would take down Bitcoin. Because the more assets that you put on the blockchain that can compete with Bitcoin, the less Bitcoin is worth. Right? Not only because you have all these other cryptocurrencies, but you have real things of real value that are on the blockchain and people can choose, right? You have competition, right? And now people start to think, well, what is this Bitcoin really worth? It's not worth anything. And when the price starts going down, right? And it's no longer going up, then what is Bitcoin? Instead of an appreciating asset, it's a depreciating asset, right? It's worth less. So then instead of people owning Bitcoin, getting the joys of deflation, they start to experience, right? Inflation in a bigger and bigger way as the price starts going down and then the entire uh, you know scenario, the entire argument falls apart. But for now, this bubble is continuing. It is uh, Bitcoin week on, on CNBC. Let's see. I mean, obviously, we have all of the, the earmarks of a peak, of a speculative mania, of a frenzy, of a blow-off top. And I think we're in that. But the only question is, how big a blow-off top is it? How vertical is this thing going to go? How high is it going to go before it comes back down to earth? That is the $64 trillion question. I'm not smart enough to know the answer to it, but I am smart enough to understand that this is a bubble and it doesn't matter how big the bubble gets, it doesn't change the nature of what it is. If it looks like a bubble, if it quacks like a bubble, if it walks like a bubble, it's a bubble. Now, I don't want to uh, end the podcast, though, by creating the impression that I think that, well, if Bitcoin is not going to work because there are other cryptocurrencies that are better, right, that are faster, uh, that are cheaper, that are more efficient, well, then let's buy those other cryptocurrencies and sell Bitcoin. That's not the point. Because ultimately, if Bitcoin's price implodes because it has no real fundamental value and some other cryptocurrency was able to usurp it because it was better, well, that will basically expose the underlying weakness of the concept. Because if Bitcoin can crash, well, then so could Bitcoin Cash, right? If Bitcoin Cash is better than Bitcoin, then something else can come up that's better than Bitcoin Cash. So the lesson that's going to be learned is when Bitcoin collapses is that it is the same thing that can happen to any cryptocurrency, no matter how good it is, no matter how much more efficient it is, no matter how much faster it is, right? Ultimately, at the end of the day, it still represents a digital currency backed by absolutely nothing. That there is no value in it. There is no value to store. You take a risk, it can implode at any moment because there's no basic value to the underlying asset or money. All other assets 
have value? What is the, uh, the asset of a stock? Well, it's the ability to generate a profit and pay a dividend. It's an actual business. Real estate, what's the value there? Well, it's a house. It provides shelter. You can live in it. You can also rent out. You can, you can earn rental income. What is the value of a bond? Well, a bond pays you interest. You collect a coupon, right? So all assets have value. Now, money, money in and of itself doesn't pay rent, right? It doesn't pay dividends unless you take the money and deposit it into a bank. And then you can take money and you can actually get a yield on it. At least you used to before the central banks, you know, embarked on this crazy uh, 0% interest rate policy. But you used to be able to take actual money and generate a return by loaning it out, either doing it yourself by making a loan, which you know, or depositing it in a bank, and you you know the bank makes the loans and and cuts you in on on the interest that they earn. But with Bitcoin, you can't do anything. Now, what about gold? Well, gold. When we were on a gold standard, you could deposit gold or money backed by gold in a bank, and you can still earn interest on it. But the other thing about gold is that. Gold has a use. Gold can be fashioned into things. You can make jewelry out of gold. You can use it in dentistry. You can use it in aerospace. You can use it in telecommunications. There are things that you can do with it. And when you're storing your gold, you are storing those uses. And in fact, as I mentioned in my last podcast, even if you use gold, you can still reuse it. Whatever you use it for, you can melt it back down and use it again. That's what makes it such a great commodity to hold on to because all that value can be stored for eternity. Bitcoin has none of those. There's no real value that it stores like real money like gold and it doesn't generate any income like an asset. Now I know some people say well some stocks don't pay dividends. That's true but they have to have earnings right. Now yes some stocks don't have earnings but that's only early on right. If there's a stock that's never going to have earnings, then it's never going to be worth anything. So the extent that people buy stocks today without earnings is because they're betting that in the future they will have earnings. And in the future, those earnings will be available for dividends. So people are buying the future potential of the stock today. But Bitcoin will never have earnings. It will never pay a dividend. It will never pay interest. It will never pay anything. And people know that going in. So it's an asset with no real value. And the same thing is true for every one of these other cryptocurrencies that have come out since Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin collapses, it doesn't mean, well, fine, we'll just make money in another cryptocurrency. It's going to be a watershed event. They're all going to come collapsing down. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, you know, when the dot-com bubble burst, Not all the companies went to zero and there were some companies that came back. Yes, real companies survived that were able to generate real earnings. Most of the companies never generated any earnings and never had the ability to generate earnings. But the ones that that survived were the ones that could ultimately prove that they had viability as an enterprise. Well, unfortunately, none of the cryptocurrencies are going to be able to prove that, right? None of these companies are Google or or even Amazon, or uh, eBay, or any of the ones that survived. As far as I'm concerned, every one of these cryptocurrencies is Pets.com.